Good morning, everyone. Today we are examining Jeremiah chapter 2 and looking at some lessons from this chapter. You know, as we read it yesterday, uh, I couldn't help but think that there are so many different lessons that we could pull from here. We could spend a few days just examining all of the lessons that you find in Jeremiah chapter 2. In this chapter, God is laying out his indictment of the people of Judah. And you're going to see a number of different statements that he is going to make uh, in laying out why it is that he is upset with them and why it is that they are going to be brought into judgment. And, and the interesting thing is it's brought from the perspective of a people that don't understand why this is happening to them. Uh, they, they are, it, it is as though they are in denial over what it is that they are doing and how it is that they are acting. And sometimes I wonder if, if we would very much be the exact same way today uh, in, in the fact that there will be Christians who will stand before God in judgment, and God's going to say basically these same things to them, and they're going to look at him in utter amazement that, uh, that everything that they've done and the way that they've done it has not just been acceptable because they're Christians and that's what they've done. But as you examine chapter 2, you start to see some of the indictment of God before his people. Notice what he says. We're going to notice three different sections this morning. And like I said, we could talk about a lot more, but we're going to narrow it down to three this morning that uh, that I find to be very interesting uh, in, in from my perspective. As you see more, feel free to lay them out and, and to utilize them and to add them to your listings. But in verse 5, beginning, we read, Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me? What that they have gone from me and followed idols, and have become idolaters? Neither did they say, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt? I brought you into a beautiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, Where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. God says, What did I do to you? What did I do to you that brought you to the place where you come here and then you start following after the gods of the nations? You know, it, it's not as though I didn't do anything to start with. He says, I brought you up out of Egypt. I led you through the wilderness. I led you through the deserts and the pits, through the land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelled, and I brought you into a beautiful country. I gave you everything that you needed. I, I gave you everything that you wanted. And now, it's not the question of where are you. It's a question of, I just don't want you anymore. Or it's a statement of, I don't want you anymore. I, 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 don't, I just don't like what you have to offer when what he's offered them is everything. So many times Christians become guilty of the same thing, or we can become guilty of the same thing. When, when we start looking at what we have in Christ and what it is that God has offered and what it is that God has given us, and, and, and then we say, but that's not what I want. What I want is what these people over here have, or what I want is what the world has over here, or what I want is this, that, or the other. We're not content with what God has provided. We're not content with who God is and what God does. We want our own selfish desires. We want what we want. That is the attitude of Israel. And that is the problem that Israel has at this particular point in time. It's not that God has left them. It's not that God hasn't taken care of them. It's that they don't have what they want, regardless of what it is that they need and what it is God has provided. They don't have everything they want. And so what they want is Baal. What they want are the idols of the people. And that's what it boils down to. 
The second thing that I've pulled from chapter 2 comes from verses 20 and 21, where there God says, For of old I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds, and you said, I will not transgress, when on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot. Yet I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into a degenerate plant of an alien vine? God says, When I brought you in, you said, I will not transgress. And you go back to Exodus 19, and that is exactly what they say. When God offers the covenant before them and God lays the covenant before their forefathers, they say, whatever it is that you command, we will do. They've reiterated that particular statement time after time after time over the generations. And yet, he says, when I look around on every high hill and on every, under every green tree, you cheat on me. You go after other gods. You lied. You didn't mean it. You have played the harlot, he calls it. He says, I planted you as a seed of the highest quality. In other words, you were the best of the best. You were the best of the people. And yet, I don't even recognize you anymore. You're not anything like what you once were. You're not anything like what you could have been. Instead, God says, you have become the degenerate plant of a foreign vine or an alien vine. You're nothing I even recognize. Even though you said that you would not transgress, that you would keep my commandments. We need to be careful. Because when we become Christians, we make that particular promise. We say, I will serve you and nobody else. I will do what you have commanded me to do. Do we keep that in our hearts? Do we focus that in our minds? Or do we become like Israel? The third area that I want to point out is verses 26 and 27, where there Jeremiah says, as the thief is ashamed when he is found out, so is the house of Israel ashamed, they and their kings and their princes and their priests and their prophets, saying to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone you gave birth to me. For they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, arise and save us. Here you see in a nutshell the problem in Israel. Israel does not become ashamed of what they're doing until they're caught until they go into trouble and trial and tribulation, until things do not go their way any longer. While things are going the way they want, God says, they will talk to a tree saying, you are my father, and to a stone saying, you gave birth to me. The, the idolatrous mindset of worshiping that which can do nothing. He says, but then when bad things happen, you turn to me and ask me to save you. It is amazing to see the way that things go when we're not doing what we're supposed to do. We act as though we don't need God. We don't want God. We want to go our own way. We want to do our own thing. We don't want the rules. We don't want the regulations, the laws, the commandments. And then all of a sudden, things go wrong. And then where do we have to turn? The only place to turn is God. That's the way many people are. Many people don't have a need for God until they do. And that's what God is talking about here. As the thief is ashamed when he is found out, so is the house of Israel ashamed. Now, they're not ashamed from the standpoint of what they're done, they've done. They're ashamed because they've been caught. And there will be many people on the day of judgment who will be ashamed because they got caught. Those are some of the lessons that I found in Jeremiah chapter 2. As I said before, there are a lot of more things that we could examine and a lot more that we could say about chapter 2. And so if you have things that you want to add, please feel free to do so. 
But those are some of the things that I found in chapter 2. Tomorrow, Lord willing, we will begin an examination of Jeremiah chapter 3. But until then, have a great day.